Hello and welcome to this EPG Patsala. I am Dr. Arindam Rai, Assistant Professor in the University of Bardhaman, West Bengal. I'll, I shall be discussing with you today the social movement and nation state in, in India and I am one of the contributors of this particular module. Well, before we go into detail, let us very briefly sum up what we propose to say over here. Well, I am going to discuss an issue which is one of the most contested uh, issue of mainstream sociology, a relationship or interrelationship between social movement and nation states in India. You know, there is a diametrically opposite viewpoint on this particular relationship. There is uh, one group of people who views that social movement is basically a pathological syndrome of a ailing system, whereas the other group hails it as a mark of social transformation. Now, instead of getting into either of this, you know, binary, let us uh, take it from a very different perspective that there is a concrete processual relationship between these two. Now, in this particular module, we would like to discuss with certain uh, illustrations, contemporary illustrations, uh, how these two diametrically opposite perspectives are related. Now, as I said, that uh, social movement and nation state constitutes to one of the, I mean, relationship between these two constitutes one of the most protracted issue of social science or mainstream social sociology. Generally, there are two different perspectives, as I just said. You know, there is a diametrically opposite relationship between these two. On the one hand, uh, social movement is basically addressed to a ailing system. I mean, whenever social movement uh, originates, it basically tries to correct some of the anomalies in the political system. State, the nation state, when it addresses this social movement, it actually tries to correct it. So they are in a way intertwined. Now here, uh, I would like to cast some light on how these two uh, kind of, uh, you know, diametrically opposite thing integrated and with certain illustrations. Now, Social mobilization often decides the future course of social movement, including the state responses to it. Now, for example, again, there is no uniform kind of a relation, uh, I mean, responses from the state. State response to social movement may vary from situation to situation, depending upon what kind of state you are referring to. In case of an authoritarian system, the responses to any kind of social movement is pretty simple. It, it, it takes as if it's a gross affront to the authority of the state. So you need to crush it at any cost. You did not want to flourish it. Sometimes there are uh, responses it's not that hurts. Sometimes it is an accommodative kind of responses, what we call the facilitating type. There, if the ideology and the means of movement you know, there is a compatibility between these two, then there is a uh, possibility that social movement may be facilitated by the state itself. Sometimes it is necessary for the state to sort of uh, re-legitimize itself. Uh, sometimes the state response to social movements uh, is of toleration. Well, state may tolerate. Sometimes the ideology may differ, but the, but the modus operandi of the social movement maybe maybe along with the state what is necessary for the state so state may tolerate that kind of movement sometimes state may discredit any social movements and to that particular response state may go on adopting outright repressive uh, uh, you know state apparatus to cross any social movements so uh, these four i mean these four responses as i have just mentioned if I just categorize it, if I just try to enumerate these four responses of the state vis-a-vis -vis social movement, then we can have four such responses. First one is facilitation uh, steps. Second one is toleration. Third one, discreditation. And fourth one is repression. Now, when there is a congruence of ideology of the state and social movement, the, the means adopted by the mobilization is legitimate. In that case, state may facilitate a social movement. There are plenty of such examples in India where st state is actually facilitating a social movement. Especially if we 
uh, draw on an uh, example of uh, uh, socialist movement in India. You know, in India, socialist movement is very difficult because in a constitutional setup where socialist, uh, uh, you know, method of overhauling the entire political state structure is not possible. So they need to tone down their radical ideology in accordance with this, uh, you know, parliamentary democratic model. So here, in there are certain states where we have a socialist model of uh, socialist model of government, and there we find this kind of method, uh, this kind of state approaches where state tries to facilitate uh, social movements along with uh, uh, you know social movements in different uh, state activities. Second, toleration. Now, toleration is when uh, the ideology of a movement differs from that of the state, but not the means. You know, if means tally, then in that case, state may tolerate. Well, uh, there are certain movements when state is not very happy with the kind of ideology of this particular movement, but the means, they, are, they do not take uh, outrightly uh, oppressive kind of, uh, you know, means, then in that case, state may go on adopting or uh, taking an approach of toleration, tolerate that movement. Third one is discreditation. In such a situation when ideology of a movement corresponds but not the means. There are so many examples out there when the, they have any social movement started with a very lofty goals but sometimes it actually it fails to carry forward that goals and in the midway they've certain sometimes opted for certain oppressive kind of uh, approaches and that is again well uh, state's response to social movement as i said just varies from one situation to another uh, sometimes state may outrightly discredit a social movement if there is an ideology of movement that corresponds to the state or nation state but state may sometimes resort to discreditation if the appro means differ there are uh, several such examples where state had to discredit such some social movements and last but not least that is the repression state may resort to outright repressive uh, you know measures to cross a social movement when a particular movement challenges the very recent data of the state the very uh, you know legitimacy of the state legitimacy of the state to rule if that got under challenge then state would not uh, go for these other soft option like fa facilitations or toleration or discreditation. State may go directly against it and try to quash that particular movement. But overall, there is a kind of a processual linkages between social movement and the nation states. Now, let us get into certain illustrations how these four, I mean, states' responses to social movement vary from situation to situation. Now, if I take the first example, that one is what we call the case study one, that is felicitation. Now, the, that is the first one, how state facilitates a particular social movement. Well, you know, if we look at the socialist movement in India, unlike the other parts of the globe, India's socialist movement is, has altogether a different, you know, chart, uh, history, check it, history. Because Indian social movement, India has a democratic uh, constitutional framework and within that constitutional framework, you can't expect to have a radical social transformation. So, the socialist movement in India had to, you know, negotiate with this kind of constitutional framework and tone down its, you know, radical jest to the constitutional uh, form of gov governance, constitutional form of social change. Now here, if we look at this kind of transformation of the socialist movement from the radical socialist movement to a parliamentary democratic model, there we find that several such socialist parties who have got uh, themselves elected in different uh, uh, sub-national states in India. And there, in those governments, if you take a, take a look at those governments' attitude to social movements, there you find a clear approach of facilitation where state tries to facilitate social movement, especially those social movements, where uh, the socialist ideologies, I mean, though moderated one, like pro-people, uh, uh, pro-people, pro-poor, pro participatory model of governance, these are some of the issues where we find that uh, 
state is actually facilitating social movements. There are several such social movements where socialist parties actually pampers sometimes, you know, uh, give them some support, moral support, impetus, so that uh, this movement can be uh, ultimately accommodated into their uh, governance process and that would bring, uh, that would con transform the government or governance into a better governance. Now, there's another, uh, uh, you know, form of uh, approach from the part of the state that is the, that I, we call the toleration. Now, what is the toleration? If the ideology may differ, but the approaches, I mean the means of social movement differs from one another, in that case, state may resort to the policies of what we call the toleration. For example, if we draw on the example of the Sarvodaya movement, the, which is, as you know, is eminently qualifies the state response of social movement. Ideologically speaking, this movement widely differs from that of the state as it questions the very institution of private property, foregrounds an uh, idealistic notion of collective ownership, trusteeship of uh, property, etc. The uniqueness of this movement is that it didn't advocate any violent, extra-constitutional, coercive approach or measure to, you know, uh, overthrow our government. And that is perhaps the reason, despite some, uh, you know, quite uh, revolutionary element into it, but state never sh see it as a challenge. And that is perhaps the reason state star starts to tolerate this kind of movement. You know, in case of Bihar, in other parts of the country, we can uh, come across this kind of Gandhian Satyagraha movement. Uh, for example, passive resistance, for example, Padayatra, or what you call the protest walk, or the voluntary donation like Bhudan, the gift of land, Gramdan, the village, uh, gift of village, or Sampati Dan, that is the gift of property, or Bhumidan, the gift of knowledge, these are some of the examples where, uh, you know, these approaches, I mean, ideology do, do not uh, tally with that of the state, but the approaches or the means is never uh, appear to the state as antithetical to the interest of the state. And that is part of the reason why state never, uh, you know, discredit this kind of social movement, rather adopt a policy of tolerating them. Because at the end of the day, it has it carries certain values, certain quintessential essential humanly values, which is necessary for our society to thrive. Now, another kind of approaches uh, that state often uh, resort to is the principle of uh, what you call the discreditation. Here, for example, if we uh, look at the Gurjar movement in recent times, in recent past in the northern part of the country, uh, initially that movement was not a threat to the state as such, because they were basically asking for uh, certain reservations, certain protective uh, sealed for them, for those uh, in, the, in, the, in the constitutional, within the constitutional bracket. But eventually that movement blown, I mean, uh, gone out of the proportion, blown out of the proportion, and then it started creating a pandemonium across the northern part of the country and started creating blockades. Uh, I mean, wasting and uh, the public property, and then state had to respond. State, in in this kind of movements, state virtually discredit this entire movement, uh, saying that it is antithetical for the interest of the public or for the uh, antithetical to the public interest. So this is a kind of uh, approach that state often ta uh, takes. Uh, that is the approach of discreditation. State discredit that, well, we don't accept this as at all a symbol of any movement. It, it has got certain, uh, you know, element which is really antithetical to the public property and public order. Another, uh, the most, uh, you know, violent kind of, uh, uh, you know, approach state often resorts to, that is the repression, repression repressionary uh, approaches where uh, state outrightly coerces a particular movement. There are again examples are at plenty. Here we can draw on certain examples. For example, first one is the Lalgar movement. Again, this movement began with a very uh, gentle note. It was 
basically uh, an incident of protesting police excesses. You know, that incident took place in uh, Lalgar in the western uh, Midnapur district of West Bengal when uh, one convoy of the then chief minister along with an union minister was being attacked, uh, abused by certain uh, fissiferous uh, you know, groups and police uh, in, as a part of the retaliatory activities, state launched a huge offensive which actually includes certain uh, manhunt and searching and combing operations across this region. And as you know, that particular region uh, is mo mostly covered by the dense forests. And those forests are being inhabited by the tribal peoples. In the process of this police operation, the, their very sentiment of this tra traditional tribal people got hurt. And they basically want uh, respite from the state. They want certain correction. They want certain uh, correctional measures for the, on the part of the state. Instead of con uh, conceding to the demands of the tribal people, state went on rampaging their homes in the name of combing operation. And ultimately, this entire uh, apparently non-violent movement went on uh, and converted into a violent one, where the local people, especially the tribals, they started uh, cutting off this particular region from the rest of the state by digging uh, the roads by putting the tree trunks in the road and almost declaring that particular region is liberated from the state of India. And as you know that it itself is a threat to the integrity and the order of the state. So state had to intervene and state instead of uh, you know listening to the villagers, to the poor uh, marginal people, state went on, uh, you know, arresting those uh, people who were actually leading this movement and virtually the entire movement being crossed. So this is one example how state actually opted for a repressory, repressionary measures uh, to, to address a kind of social movement which is not compatible with the state ideology or the means of the movement is not uh, uh, acceptable to the state. Another example we can draw on is, uh, uh, is as you all know, uh, nowadays it's quite, quite uh, uh, easily uh, uh, we can come across this movement, that is the Singur movement, the land, uh, this famous land uh, mo movement against the land acquisition. You know, Singur movement was not only a movement, uh, you know, uh, by a group of people who are being ousted from a particular uh, land. It is, it actually brings forth one of the protracted issue of development, that is development induced displacement. Now, the entire story started like this. I mean, the last government, the, the I mean, the Diden government, the then left front government in West Bengal, in a, after elected for the seventh consecutive terms with a thumping majority, they tried to, you know, translate that particular mandate into the, their developmental activities. So they launched a huge uh, developmental offensives. And as a part of that, uh, they, uh, they came into a move, I mean, the memorandum of understanding with the Tata Motor Company to set up a car uh, manufacturing unit in uh, Singur, uh, only 750 kilometers away from Calcutta. So initially, uh, the movement uh, begins as this proposed factory, you know, mop up a huge uh, tilling land of which most of them are mostly uh, fertile lands. So the people, especially the farmers, they do not accept this proposal. They want uh, bring back their I mean, the land. So state initially uh, started giving them certain shops like uh, uh, compensation package and compensation package was in fact one of the large, highest one in the, in the country at that time. But despite that, a movement uh, by these so-called, uh, I mean, outsties uh, began and that actually uh, ultimately uh, challenged the very 
future of that particular movement. So, state initially soft peddling with this particular movement, trying to make them aware that this is for the benefit of this entire region. But when the movement gone uh, out of the, their hand, they started, I mean, actions, the police actions, especially the repressionary actions, they had taken certain uh, repressionary measures. And that actually uh, created huge, uh, you know, that actually worsened the situation. And ultimately, the Tata Motors had to withdraw from that very, uh, from that very project. Now, this is the story. And here, the role of the state was especially repressionary because initially state went on uh, crushing this movement instead of engaging them into a dialogue. So the repressive uh, measures on the part of the state cannot put out the ember of the movement. The resoluteness of these disposes people led by the opposition leaders ultimately stands vindicated and Tata have decided to abandon the project. Though the incident is often projected as the death knell for the industrial prospect of the state, it also signifies the inherent strength of social movement. Moreover, the illegality of the Land Acquisition Act was exemplified by the Calcutta High Court, which categorically mentioned that the Act had a provision of acquiring private land for public purpose, not for the private business. The social movement, so therefore, now, if we, uh, after those illustrations, if we come to this analytical part, then we can very easily mention that the social movement and nation states are reciprocally integrated. Whereas social movements are deliberately formed uh, collective mobilized, through collective mobilizations, including uh, intending to bring about rapid social transformations, institutions like states are the instrumentalities which have been guided against nation states to bring about certain changes or resist certain possibilities of change. So social movement act as a boon in disguise for institutions. If an institution keeps on ignoring the periodic challenges guided against it, there is a strong possibility that it may become structurally and culturally irrelevant. So therefore, social movement is not always a bane. Sometimes it proves to be a boon because it gives you a wake-up call. You, it gives you a you know, reality check that where, where went wrong. I mean, uh, whether the governance process is altogether right or not. Because this occasional uh, you know, signaling actually you know, saves you from becoming structurally and culturally irrelevant. Therefore, institution retains their relevance by being exposed to intermittent social movements. In other words, a social movement offers an institution with an unique opportunity of re-legitimization. Re so, social movements often provides you an opportunity to re-legitimize yourself. How and why you are still relevant, you can re-legitimize it, but only you allow social movements to occur. You know, there are certain social systems, there are certain political systems where no such voice of the people being allowed. So if you just muzzle the voice of the people, if you stop, you know, congregating people in a space more than two or three, then that means you are basically uh, destroying or you are basically making yourself irrelevant because you would not get the reality check. You don't know what went wrong. When you are actually understand, when you actually come across that problem, that time the problem will be blown out of proportion. So therefore, it will be too late to respond. So, institutions and movement are reciprocally linked into three significant ways. Now, first, institutions and structures are cleansed by movements. You know, the movements often cleansed a system. What are often labeled as fundamentalists or revivalist movements are essentially attempts to rescue 
institutions from their current stage of degeneration and render them back on track or back on their pristine purity as defined by the visionaries of those movements. Conversely, institutions tend to correct movements from their adventurism. You know, there are certain movements which actually begins in a constitutional manner and then it goes haywire. So, an institution has the, the, the sort of ability to correct a movement from falling into the trap of adventurism. Secondly, a movement deliberately creates uh, institutions which are new vehicle to fulfill the present vision and aspirations. Similarly, institution may float uh, movements to sustain their legitimacy. As I have just mentioned that there are uh, institutions which wants to float certain uh, social movement so that it can re-legitimize itself. And thirdly, the movement tends to redefine the old institutions. The effort being not simply to purify or inject institutions with new verbs and vitality, not to abandon them completely and create new ones, but to recreate them. So to conclude, in this uh, entire module, what we have tried to do is, we had tried to show the interrelationship, the intricate interrelationship between social movements and nation state and constitutes, which constitutes one of the protracted issue of mainstream sociology. Now, generally, they are being put into two, uh, you know, diametrically opposite terms. Sometimes a few people said that oh, social movement is basically the symbol of an ailing system. It is basically a pathological syndrome. Whereas other retreated, I mean, other challenges this particular proposition saying that it is basically the mark of the regeneration of the system. So, despite the projecting them into a diametrically opposite version, there is a processual linkage between these two and which sustains one another. If we look at uh, the different social movements that I have just mentioned, there we can find that uh, these two, I mean, social movements and nation state uh, sustain one another. And therefore, we should not be treat we should not treat them into two watertight compartments. Thank you. And for more information, please visit ePartsala websites and other references. Thank you.